Are you leading the shades? I, I will we'll try. All right. We'll try. Go for it. Enough. All right. Thank you very much, John. Great. So thanks very much for the very kind introduction and for the invitation to, to come and speak today. And thanks to all of you for, for coming. Uh, as John mentioned, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a, I'm a roboticist. So I thought what I would do today is to talk a little bit about our approach to robotics. And I'm going to pick out a few projects that I've been involved in over the past few years that have philosophical implications. And part of the reason why I'm here today is hopefully you can see some implications in the kind of work that we do that we may miss and that might lead to some future collaborations. So, uh, so pay attention. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a, I consider myself more of a, a scientist. And I consider myself more of a scientist than an engineer because unlike a lot of my colleagues uh, in robotics, I'm interested less in robots as tools, as machines like any other technology that might make our life simpler or easier or more fulfilling. That's important. We want robots that, that can help us out in the real world. But as a scientist, I'm more interested in robots as scientific tools. So autonomous and adaptive machines, uh, as we all know, they're starting to appear in our everyday lives. But they also serve as a very new kind of experimental methodology that allows us to address questions that may be difficult without this particular kind of tool. So John actually mentioned I'm the treasurer of the Society, International Society for Artificial Life. So it's a good example to start out with. Um, artificial life is a sister field to robotics. And investigators in artificial life try and create simulations of living systems or even create new living systems in the lab that are independent from biological systems. So they don't share a common ancestor. And the idea is that if we can do that, now we have not just one instance of a living system, life on Earth, we have multiple independent instances and we can look across that forest of life and ask questions about, about not just life as it is, which is what biologists do, they study the sample size of one that we have on this planet, but instead, as the founder of the field of artificial life said, Chris Langton, we can study the broader question of life as it could be given the opportunity to get started. So um, like a few of my other colleagues in robotics and AI, we have a similar goal in robotics and AI, which is to study not just cognition as it is instantiated in humans and animals and plants, if you're, if you're willing, but rather how cognition is in general given the opportunity to get going. So the long-term goal for myself uh, and my lab is to really try and attack this question of what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for cognition in general, not just Earth-based cognition. OK, very big goal. I don't know if I'll see it ever uh, achieved, but that basically guides a lot of the projects that we do. And I hope the projects that I show you today show you how we try and attack this question of cognition as it could be. Okay, so I'm going to start with robotics. I'm going to start with some very tangible things and we'll move into the philosophical implications as we go. I usually start most of my talks on robotics with this slide. Um, historically, robotics have already been incredibly useful to society. They've completely transformed, as you can see in the top two images, they've completely transformed the way that we build things indoors. Right? Henry Ford systematized mass production. Industrial robots in the 70s and 80s automated mass production. Right? So building things indoors is no longer done by humans, but building things out of doors on construction sites is still done by humans. If robots are so useful for building things indoors, why don't we have them out of doors? This is an interactive lecture, so why this, why this difference? Any ideas? In controlled environments, right? So I know I'm in philosoph uh, among philosophers, so I'm going to be very careful. Heraclitus may have said 2,000 <laughs> years ago, man never enters the same river twice, right? So we are adaptive agents. I've given thousands of lectures about robots by this point, I think, but never in this room, never to this audience. One of the, one of the hallmarks of intelligence is adaptation in some way, right? Now, what kind of adaptation we could argue about, but it's incredibly important. 
So as a society, we have figured out how to build complex machines. We can build industrial robots, we built smartphones, we built the HPC, we built the space station, we can build complex machines. What we have a very hard time doing is building adaptive machines. You can imagine a construction site, we might just want a machine that carries piles of bricks from point A to point B, but even that simple task, of robots are going to have to adapt how they do it for every new construction site. Okay, so that's, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges to robotics, right? Computers and robots both uh, were born in the Second World War, and look at computers now, right? They're beyond anyone's wildest imaginings. Robots, not so much. That being said, of course, in the last few years, there have been some amazing advances in robotics. This is a video from Boston Dynamics that went viral a few weeks ago. Uh, I've sped it up just in the interest of, of time. This is live and real. There's no invisible wires here. Um, this is the Atlas robot, which is in an important sense adaptive, right? The actual gait of this robot is adaptive, uh, adapting to uneven terrain uh, and so on. And if I let this video keep going, you'll see an investigator uh, mess with this robot with a hockey stick. This is something that's very difficult in robotics, combining locomotion and object manipulation. Very sophisticated. Here comes our uh, robot torturer. There, there's, a, there's a sadistic streak. There's a sadistic streak that seems to run through roboticists for some reason, but there you, there you go. Okay. You really, start to, you really start to feel sorry for Atlas after a while. Right? Okay. An interesting side note I just saw on the news yesterday, um, Boston Dynamics was bought last year by Google and Google has just sold it. Um, very sophisticated machine, probably not going to turn a profit for anyone in the immediate future, but obviously has long-term potential. Okay. Just interesting detail there. So this is the state of the art as of 2016. If we go back if we go back a few years, we go back uh, almost 30 years, this is a robot that was built by Mark Raybert, the CEO of Boston Dynamics. This was work he did when he was back at MIT. This is his 3D biped. There's, again, a few wires here, but these wires are not holding up the robot. So as sophisticated as Atlas is, if you put it in the historical context of what's gone on in the last 30 years of robotics, you could argue that advances have been somewhat limited. And again, I would argue part of the reason why is we have a hard time sitting down and designing and building adaptive machines. Okay, so that's robotics. Uh, it's interesting to then switch to AI, where you kind of throw away the body and focus on the brain. Again, everyone's heard about um, the fact that Go has now fallen to machines. Um, very exciting. Everyone's very excited about it. In the same way, you go back now 20 years, and a machine also took chess away from us, and there was a lot of excitement at the time. The technology that went into the machines that beat people at chess, they sort of had limited utility. They're good for playing chess, but not good for much, much else. So this is something we always need to be careful of in robotics and AI. It goes through a lot of hype and bust. Our advances actually real advances that are going to take us towards increasingly adaptive and increasingly general machines, right? That's really what we want, is machines that can help us out in an increasing number of tasks in an increasingly broadening number of environments, right? That's, that's the main goal. Okay, so why limited progress in AI and robotics? Well, I would say that the reason why making adaptive machines is so difficult is because a lot of researchers in robotics and AI tend to focus on replicating the products of evolution. And they tend to focus on one product in particular, which is the, the human central nervous system. This is arguably the most complex uh, artifact we know of in the universe. We have absolutely no idea how this works. We're making a little bit of progress again, but still it is basically mysterious. How can you replicate something in a machine if you don't know how it works? What neurological details in this thing should we build into our machine? Neurons, probably. Synapses, probably. Glial cells, maybe. Is the vasculature system of the brain contributing to the information theoretic processing of the brain? Turns out 
as we've learned in the last few years? Yes, probably. So if you don't simulate uh, blood supply to the brain, you're actually probably missing something that's important, and there's probably dozens of other subsystems that we're also missing. Right? So very difficult to build adaptive machines if we're trying to copy a very complex thing that we don't understand very well. Okay, so uh, instead of trying to model or instantiate the products of evolution, in my particular uh, field of robotics that I work in, which is evolutionary robotics, we don't try and simulate the products of evolution. Instead, we try and replicate the process of evolution. The basic algorithm of descent, Darwinian descent with modification is pretty simple. So we can implement that in machines. Now, of course, what happens from there gets very complicated very quickly. But in evolutionary robotics, the idea is that we want to try and take a step back. And instead of building machines by hand or building the body of a robot and using learning algorithms to just tune up the brain of our robot, we are going to allow evolution to try and create adaptive machines for us. She's done it once already. Maybe Mother Nature can do it again in this time with, with machines. So I'm going to show you two videos now. And, and as you can see from the citations here, these are from two different experiments. But I wanted to put these side by side to just give you an idea for how evolutionary robotics works. We start by designing a utility function. So what is it that we want the robot to do? We give that utility function to the computer, and the computer can then observe a bunch of simulated robots. So at any one time, the computer is always simulating a population of robots. In this case, we've got 16 robots. And the utility function that we gave to the computer is evolve robots that travel into the screen as quickly as possible, or towards the top of the screen, if you like. This is a snapshot partway through an evolutionary process. Um, they're all genetically very similar to one another. At this point, it's actually impossible to tell that they're moving slightly differently, but they are. And as this video rolls on, you'll see that these 16 robots are going to start to diverge in their gait slightly in the direction that they travel. Here we go. So the computer is simulating these robots, but it's also observing them. And when this simulation ends, it's going to apply that utility function to each of these 16 robots. The robots that don't move very quickly or crash into each other or come to a stop or flip over or go in the opposite direction are going to be deleted. There's two robots at the top of the screen that you can see there. Those, at this point in time, happen to be traveling a little bit faster than the other 14 robots. So those 14 robots are deleted, those two are retained, and those two are mutated and crossed until they produce 14 new robots that fill those 14 slots. Rinse and repeat for however much, much time you get on the, the supercomputer. John mentioned the VACC back at UVM. We keep our supercomputer running all the time with these kinds of simulations. OK, but this is simulation. We use 3D physics engines, so these are not that different from what you'd find in a modern video game. If the computer manages to evolve a robot that's sufficiently interesting or manages to achieve a sufficiently high value of the utility function, we might then go to the extra effort of manufacturing a physical version of one of these robots. And as I mentioned, this is not the robot that came from the simulation, but this is the basic flow. Evolve populations evolve populations of simulated robots, 3D print one or more of them, and see how they do in reality. That's the basic evolutionary robotics algorithm. And I'm going to show you some enhancements to that basic algorithm that have philosophical implications. So far, so good? If there's any basic clarification questions, I'm happy to take them as we, as we go. OK. So, uh, so what, what's the difference here? Why do? My colleagues tend to spend so much time on this, and I kind of already gave it away here. Um, most roboticists who know better tend to implicate this man as the reason why roboticists tend to spend so much time on the brain, right? The body is simple and dirty and temporary and so on, so that's, that's easy, right? As an engineer, we can figure out how to build a good body for a robot. That's easy. The brain much more difficult, so we'll fix some of the things that we know about the human brain, and then we'll apply whatever the current best machine learning algorithm is to tune up the brain of the robot, right? These are separate systems. 
we don't need to worry about the body, we're going to focus on the brain. Some roboticists are aware of Cartesian dualism, some uh, don't even know that they're infected with, with dualism, right? So in e evolutionary robotics, what we're really trying to do is to not force a distinction between body and brain. What we're usually doing when we're evolving these populations of robots is evolving not just the nervous system of the robot, but also its body, and hoping that evolution will find a good combination of body and brain that works for whatever the task is. Right? We're trying to avoid Cartesian dualism as best we can. Okay, so this is the idea of embodied cognition. I think most people here are familiar with it, but just to place embodied cognition in a modern context, Let's take one of the important building blocks of intelligence, categorization. If you can't categorize, you're not going to do very well in the real world. Here's a non-embodied approach. This is the typical non-embodied approach to categorization. You take a very large training corpus, might be a large number of images of cubes and cylinders. You take that training corpus and you train, these days you train a deep belief network. Uh, a deep learner to be able to spit out the correct label for each of these training instances. Once you finish training, you now supply the trained network with novel stimulus. So this is a cylinder that it's never seen before. And if it spits out the right answer, then it's learned to categorize or distinguish between uh, cubes and cylinders. Now think about what is this what is the representation or what is the meaning, quote unquote, to this network of cubes and cylinders? And I'm not going to try and answer that question, but I want you to look now at this robot, which also evolves the ability to categorize, but in an embodied way. So he, and again, this is another example of an evolutionary robotics experiment. This is some work we published a few years ago. Now when the utility function is not locomotion, it's object manipulation. What I'm showing you in this video here is the initial population of random robots, which are not doing a very good job of categorizing the objects that we place in front of it. After a couple of hours, this is what we saw in the evolutionary simulation. It's starting to manipulate the objects, but it's still fumbling the ball a little bit. And after eight hours, we got this, I'll just pause this for a moment. What you're going to watch in this third video is just one evolved robot. What I was showing you in the first two videos was each robot in the population being tested out by the computer one after the other. This is now just one evolved robot and you can actually see how it's categorizing. How is this robot signaling to us that it knows the difference between edged objects and round objects. Absolutely. So it lifts edged objects to the left and round objects to the right or vice versa. This robot has no language, but it can, but it can clearly signal to us that it has evolved the ability to categorize between these objects. So what does edged and round objects mean to this robot, and how is that different from what round and edged objects mean to this neural network. I forgot to mention this robot also has a neural network inside it. Whatever the case may be, these two machines have very different representations or understandings of these objects. In the embodied robot case, what a, what a round object means to this one is some sensor motor dynamic. When I reach like this, I feel this kind of tactile uh, sensation on my fingertips. When I lift it, I feel this kind of distribution of strain in my arm. That's what a round object is. If you ask me to tell you, rather than just showing you that I know the difference, that's the kind of explanation it would give you. This one will give you this object is some hierarchical composition of simpler features. I would argue that this one has a better understanding of round and edged objects for the simple sense that it's closer to our understanding of round and edged objects. Of course, I can show you pictures of round and edged objects and you can do just fine, but for you, a round object and an edged object have a lot of other connotations than just what they look like, right? This is a Gibsonian approach to this problem of, of affordances. So no matter how good we get at training networks to distinguish between objects, 
they, this way, they're never going to, ha I would argue, they're never going to have the, um, an embodied understanding of these objects in the same way that we do. And that's going to cause problems if we want to try and, uh, if we want these things to inhabit the same world that we do. There are certain situations that are going to arise where we think it's situation A and the machine thinks it's situation B just because we have different understandings of what A and B is, right? That's already a dangerous situation. You said the, the second, the grasper, yes. right, has, has a neural network also. Correct. Are, are you saying in addition to that, it has some form of evolutionary algorithm? So we use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve the neural network to distinguish between round and edged objects. So what I showed you in the third video is now a product of evolution. It's just one robot that has an evolved neural network. But that neural network is able to distinguish between these different objects, not just because of its visual input, but because of how it feels to physically interact with objects in the real world. What about the neural network evolved? What about the neural network of Oz? Oh, oh, what features of it? Okay, right, so that's a good question. Let me, um, let me back up to this picture. Here's a neural network. It depends on the experiment. In this particular experiment, we fixed the cognitive architecture, so we built in the sensors and motors and neurons and so on. We placed the synaptic weights under evolutionary control. That's the only thing that evolved, which produces particular interactions between the robot and the physical world. So it's the same network that's controlling the grasper. It's not exactly the same. We didn't use a deep belief network here. I'm just using a, yeah, the latest not example. Yeah, the same as that one. Not the it's, same, but, but it's the same. the evolving network that's controlling the robotic. Correct. That's right. So what you're seeing in this video is one evolved neural network, and I'm playing it. I'm, putting, I'm, I'm resetting the simulation and playing back that evolved neural network in the presence of different objects. And because the objects are different, the robot reacts differently. That's the only thing that's different in the different little animations you see in that video. Does that clarify your... No. Okay. So what are you evolving about the neural network? So we're evolving the, the weight of influence between this neuron and this neuron. So we have an input layer which is getting information from the sensors, and those are flowing through the neural network. The values that arrive at the output layer are dictating how the motors behave. So it's basically what we're evolving is how the robot moves in response to whatever stimulate, sensory stimulation it gets. Yes? There was no flag at the outset that you even wanted this to divide these into two categories. Uh, th there is in the utility function. So the utility function here says, uh, the utility function said grasp objects, lift objects, and if it's edged, so it, it defi we're definitely telling it when it's doing the right thing or the wrong thing, but we're not giving it explicit labels. It has to figure that out on its own. Okay, so that's, again, just to show how the relationship between evolutionary robotics, where we're evolving embodied agents, and embodied cognition. If the body is important for grounding aspects of cognition, that's an exceedingly non-intuitive thing for a human engineer to sit down and do by hand. But evolution has already done it once with us, so why not ask evolution to evolve embodied agents in a way that they exploit their interaction with the environment to get useful work done, which in this case is categorization. Okay, so that's, uh, that's categorization. Let's move on to another aspect, another important building block of cognition, self-awareness. So this is the Resilient Machines project we did a few years ago. This was in collaboration with Hod Lipson and Victor Zykoff at Cornell. This started with a very practical goal, which is, uh, again, coming back to the issue of a construction site. What happens if the environment of a robot changes in a completely novel way, and the robot has no contingency plan to deal with that change? And I'll walk you through how this works. Again, I'm going to show you a bunch of videos that are snapshots from this experiment. We start with our physical robot in this case, and our physical robot has no understanding of self, it has no understanding of the world. All it does is it moves and it records the sensory repercussions of those actions. I push against the world in this way and I sense that the world pushes back in this way. So after a few of these actions it has some sensor motor data. This physical robot then starts up an evolutionary simulation 
And again, I'm showing you now an evolutionary simulation where it's trying out a whole bunch of different models in this case. The utility function in this case is find a body plan that when you supply the same motor program, you get the same sensory result as the physical robot. And if you watch carefully, at this point, it had a very poor conception of itself. But as evolu I took this snapshot right at the point during evolution when it hit on the right answer, which is I'm a, qu I'm a radially symmetric quadruped. And if I move with any of the motor programs carried out by my physical counterpart, I get the same sensory repercussion in simulation. So this robot can indirectly create a model of self in an embodied manner. So it's, it, the way it defines itself is it says, well, this is what I think I'm, this is how I think I'm put together. And the reason I think that is because whenever I do, and whenever I mentally simulate what I did in reality, I get the same sensory result. Okay, so now we have our physical robot and it's armed with a self model. Uh, this was actually work that was carried out for NASA. NASA said, okay, imagine we give our, ro our robot probe on another planet or another moon, some mission to carry out. We would like it to figure it out on its own. So how does it do that? In this case, the mission, quote unquote, for the robot is just to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Before trying anything in reality, it says, look, I have a good self model now. Why don't I use that rather than trying out things that might actually be dangerous on the surface of another planet. So it starts up a second evolutionary simulation. In this case, the, the model of self is fixed. And now, again, it's evolving neural networks for this robot that get this robot from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. So one evolutionary simulation that's developing models of self and a second evolutionary simulation that's using the self model to try out potentially dangerous ideas before trying them in in reality. So uh, Popper said one of the good things about self-awareness is it allows your hypotheses to die in your stead, right? I wonder what would happen if I got really close to the edge of that cliff. Better to think about that than, than try it out. Okay, so our robot has come up with this idea, which at least according to the self-model works. And then as you've already seen with this video, it tries it out in reality. And in this case, it does more or less in reality what it did in, in simulation. So we have a robot that can build up self-models and try things out in reality. It turns out that these self-models are useful for a, uh, another reason, which is, what if something unexpected happens? So we sent in the PhD student, in this case with a screwdriver, and they mechanically separated the, right, the bottom part of the robot's right leg here. The robot doesn't know that. It has no pain receptors. It has no sensors right there to detect that change. All this robot knows is that when it moves, it now gets a different sensory, there's a se different sensory repercussion. So either I've changed, the environment has changed or both has changed. So how does it discriminate between all of these different hypotheses? You can probably guess by now. It turns on the first evolutionary simulation. It says, as far as I know at the moment, this is what I look like. But this model, this model of self, no longer fits the current sensor motor data that I'm getting. So let's just keep running evolution. And evolution says, maybe I've got three and a half legs. Um, which is actually the right answer. Maybe my leg has shrunk, but that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't make physical sense, so evolution eventually gets rid of it. And just at the end of this short video, it goes back to saying, the only model that I've found so far through an evolutionary search is this one, and that makes sense. I'm now a three-and-a-half-legged robot. So it developed a self-model, and it adapted that self-model when there was an important change to self. NASA says, okay, damaged robot, um, we know you're damaged, you're on another planet, this is a very dangerous situation, we don't actually know how you're damaged, you figure it out, right? So this is the idea, you need to use a self-model to do so. Once it does, NASA says the mission is still the same, get from the left side of the table to the right side of the table, no matter what's happened to you, right? Billions of taxpayer dollars on the line here, do something. Okay, so we start up, the second evolutionary simulation, it throws out the original gate, 
which is no longer appropriate for a three-and-a-half-legged robot. But evolution doesn't care. It just keeps evolving, and it eventually comes up with a qualitatively different gait, which gets it from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. And, okay, too many videos in one talk here. Bear with me here. So it comes up with a different model. Uh, it comes up with a different gait for this change situation. Okay, keep your fingers crossed here. There we go. Okay. Qualitatively different gait. It's not very efficient. If you watch carefully, it's actually walking in a semicircle. That's not really what we want it to do. But it's basically doing what we asked it to do, get from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Okay, so incredibly useful from a practical point of view because we have an adaptive machine that can deal with changes in its environment. What about the philosophical repercussions of this? Well, we went from a robot that has no self-awareness to a robot that has self-awareness in the trivial interpretation of that word, that it's aware when one part of its body goes missing, right, or something, something out there changes. There's a clear... Uh, adaptive advantage for animals to have this capability and there's a clear practical reason for a robot to have one. What about this robot? We could with just a few lines of code turn this robot into this robot by just taking that algorithm that I just described to you and make it a recursive algorithm. So now we would say robot instead of uh, instead of becoming aware of self become aware of the fact that you're aware of self, right? So I'm going to avoid the C word in this talk, but this is recursive self-awareness, right? And we're capable of this, so it raises the interesting question of what is the what was the adaptive advantage for us to go from us, meaning biological life, to go from this to this to this and maybe to this, right? We're now talking about the fact that we're aware of our self-awareness, so I think we're now at this this level, right? It's turtles all the way, it's robots all the way down in this, this case. So again, as a roboticist, this is something I'd like your take on when we have the Q&A session. There's a good reason for us to do this. We could do this just for fun, but would this actually make these robots more useful, more adaptive, able to do tasks that this, that this robot cannot do and this, this robot could not do? That's kind of where we are with this project and would love to hear more about that. Okay. We're doing pretty well here. So we've talked a little bit about categorization. We've talked a little bit about self-awareness. Now we're going to talk about language and meaning. And I'll be very careful in this, this part, depending on what you think meaning means. This is a paper uh, that we just compl I just completed with one of my graduate students. It's in review, so this is brand new work. So uh, trying this out for the first time here. This is an attempt to allow robots to ground symbols, right? So most of you are familiar with the symbol grounding problem. We can't really train an AI to understand language by giving it a dictionary and say, if you don't look, know, understand a word, look up the definition. And if you don't understand the words in the definition, go look up those words in the dictionary. You get in this infinite regress and around and around you go. And a robot could obvious, or an AI could obviously digest however large a dictionary or encyclopedia we give it but it's going to have this sort of symbol grounding problem, right? Those symbols are never going to be grounded in the machine's own sensor motor experiences. So could we actually do that? And there have been attempts before ours to do this. Our attempt was to try and do this at scale. And to do that, we tried to rely on this new idea of crowdsourcing. So we're going to actually recruit the crowd through a website. And this is back to John's comment about designing robots in six seconds. We have a bunch of websites where you can come and be guinea pig pigs, I mean human subjects, for, uh, for our experiments. So uh, I'll explain how this works, and then we'll look at how these robots actually ground symbols. Uh, Subjects that arrived at this website were told uh, to watch the video, and I'll show you just a little bit of the video to give you a feel for what's happening. So they're watching in real time a simulation, so we're piping the simulation um, through a video upload to uh, a website called Twitch, which is where millions of young people go to watch video games. It's an amazing phenomenon in and of itself. So this is Twitch Plays Robotics. So instead of watching a video game, you're watching the robots. And we tell the subjects to think of these robots as pets. You can issue any command you want to these robots. Go forward, stay still, 
turn left, jump, solve for Matt's last theorem. You can ask them to do anything you want. When you do ask them to do something, one of those commands, whatever it is, will be in effect for the next five minutes. So uh, if you look carefully, you may not be able to see from the back there. At the moment, the crowd is voting that the next command to issue to the robot is crawl forward. It's what they'd like to try and teach the robot. Already, you can see that the crowd is not issuing things like solve for Matt's last theorem. They ask that one, they ask all sorts of other crazy things, right? This is the internet. But generally speaking, they converge on very motoric language, which seems appropriate to the robot they're observing, right? So are the humans teaching the robots or the robots teaching the humans, right? You have bi-directional scaffolding going on here. So uh, it, I'll unpause this video in a moment and crawl forward will become the command for the next five minutes. When crawl forward is in effect, watch what the robot does. And if it actually does crawl forward, give it a reward. If it does not crawl forward, give it a punishment, right? Standard reinforcement learning. But it's an open-ended system. The crowd can try and teach the robot anything you, anything you want. Okay, so uh, again, so commands are in the top right here. People are voting on what do they want to try and teach the robot next. We actually exposed the crowd to two different robots, the little worm robot that you just saw and the legged robot here, which has different uh, possibilities of motion. Um, there's the live uh, comment field here. People are talking about what command to issue. They're also cursing at each other as they do on the internet and all sorts of other things. And uh, let me speed this up a little bit. In the bottom right panel here, now the command that's in effect is actually walk forward. So at the moment that the robot switched from the worm to the leg, they stopped ask the crowd stopped asking for crawl forward and started to ask for walk forward. So the crowd is already responding to the embodiment of the robot. They try and teach different commands based on the robot's body plan. Okay, I'm gonna show you the same video. This one is now sped up nine times, I think, so you get a feel for what's happening here. You have more or less people uh, in attendance at the site and they're trying to teach uh, English to these robots. We we're hoping for people to also try and teach the robot other languages, but again, being the internet, mostly English here. Okay. So the question then is, did these robots manage to ground any of the symbols or the commands issued by the crowd? And it turns out, as far as we know, and this is again very new work, the robots managed to ground at least one command which, or symbol, which is the command jump. So here's what happens. Uh, the crowd issued this command jump many, many times. And whenever they did, the robot would just move at random. At this point, there's no evolution going on. And the crowd would either reward or punish the robot under that, that command. So what you're seeing in this plot here is the crowd's response to the simple robot whenever the simple robot was told to jump. The horizontal axis here is reporting this, the, the action itself. And in this case, the action was, or the sensor motor uh, action, the sensor motor dynamic here was, what was the fraction of time during which at least one part of the robot was in contact with the ground? So the robot has a number of touch sensors in each body part. It can feel whether that touch sensor is firing or not. Points uh, that have a horizontal coordinate that's closer to one, those are robots that were also always in contact with the ground. This point over here at 0.47, this was a robot that only spent 47% of the time in contact with the ground, 53% of the time it was in the air. The vertical coordinate of each point that you see here is the crowd's response to that particular action. So out here, when the robot spent uh, only 45% of the time on the ground, uh, the crowd responded negatively. And I, now that I'm saying that, I realize that this is reversed. Actually, the crowd would reward in that case. I apologize. We'll have to go back and fix this. So we can just mentally rotate this picture in your mind. The dotted line here, we just did simple linear regression. And it finds, not surprisingly, the more rare that the tactile sensors fired, the more positively response 
the more positively the crowd responded to that action. Right? Not, not really that surprising. So again, if we were to ask this robot what the word jump means, it would say there's a symbol, J-U-M-P, or there's four symbols, J-U-M-P, and whenever that symbol is presented to me and I do this, this is the kind of response I expect from the crowd. That's what J-U-M-P means. That's the simple robot. The complex robot also was told to jump a lot, and it also successfully grounded this symbol. It also learned offline that whenever uh, tactile sensation is minimized, the crowd responds positively. And I apologize again, these are very fresh plots. It's hard to see here, but the actual slope and intercept of this line are slightly, sorry, are slightly different meaning that both robots have grounded the symbol jump, but in slightly different ways. So this symbol actually means something slightly different to these two robots because of their morphology. So there's an interesting philosophical implication here. Jump means something to all of us, but an important aspect of the word jump, our interpretation of that has a lot to do with our own body. So if we teach a robot to jump, it might have a, a slightly different understanding of what jump means from what we think it means. Okay, so that's language and meaning. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, a last section. This one's kind of a little bit for fun. This is about robot ethics. As we all know, robots and AI are back in fashion with a vengeance. And whenever robots and AI come back into fashion, along with the hype also comes the fear that we're soon going to be overrun by Arnold Schwarzenegger's and Skynet and whatever, right? So, um, an interesting book, if you haven't come across it, Nick Bostrom wrote this a few years ago. Assuming that we can make super intelligent machines, could we possibly ensure that they are safe? And if you've read it, uh, he's pretty pessimistic. He outlines a lot of paths towards different kinds of super intelligent AIs. Most of them don't end well for, for humanity. Very intricate argumentation that goes in here. I'm going to focus on just one of the paths that Bostrom talked about, which is the issue of pathological instantiation. So imagine for the moment that we do achieve a super intelligent AI, and we give it the utility function of making everyone as happy as possible. A, a super intelligent AI, if it is super intelligent, will say, I got a great idea how to do that. It surgically implants a wire in everybody's pleasure center of their brain and stimulates that wire. And if you were to ask people, they'd say they're very, very happy. Right? It's maximized the utility function that we gave to the super intelligent AI, but in a pathological, uh, I think actually he called it perverse instantiation, a pathological or perverse way. Right? Okay, so now we go back and say, all right, super intelligent AI, make everyone happy, but don't perform any surgical procedures on us. You can imagine there is also a perverse instantiation that will make everyone happy in the way that we would not have liked to have been made happy. This is the problem. You may laugh and think, okay, that's not, that's not likely to happen. Let me come back to our robot here for a moment. Perverse or pathological instantiation happens all the time in robotics and also in evolutionary robotics. So as I mentioned, the utility function for the physical robot here was to get from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. We built this robot as a quadruped, expecting that it would stand up and exhibit one of the standard quadrupedal gates, but it doesn't, right? It came up with this gate, which is really kind of non-intuitive. We thought this was a one-off. We went back and did the experiment again. It again came up with this particular gate. The utility, whatever it is that's selected for the, the quadrupedal gates that we see in nature are not just about displacement, right? So we assumed we would get the same result, but we didn't because the background of this, the evolutionary background of this robot is very different from our evolutionary background. So here, it doesn't really matter that we saw perverse instantiation, but as we start to build autonomous cars and other important machines that are going to be interacting with humans, pathological instantiation is going to be extremely important, right? If the utility functions for autonomous cars are get people from point A to point B safely and in a timely manner and so on, you can be sure that if we give enough autonomy, uh, the cars are going to come up with a way of doing that in a way that we would have preferred that they didn't, right? So at least in my experience as a roboticist, 
perverse instantiation is ubiquitous. It is a real problem that we and we don't have to wait for super intelligent machines. We're already bumping up against this problem. Okay, so how do we combat perverse instantiation? There's again, this is all sort of in theory at the moment. There's an interesting uh, idea out there uh, from Yudkowsky. Um, you can take the place where this was published with a grain of salt if you like, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, Yudkowsky uh, proposed coherent extrapolated volition, or CEV, as a way to combat perverse instantiation. There's lots of different ways of interpreting what he meant by CEV. This is my attempt to boil down what he said to one sentence, which is a friendly AI which we can think of as an AI that avoids pathological instantiation, should implement policies for us in a way that despite human differences, our future selves would be likely to approve of those policies. So let me try and unpack this a little bit. So the coherent part means that, of course, we're all different, right? A particular policy that an AI might come up with might be OK with one half of the population and not with the other half, right? This is a problem we're, we're facing at the moment up until November, right? This is a common uh, issue in, in humanity. So uh, in society, so Yudkowsky said, well, we need to think about future selves, right? Maybe there's going to be a point where we're going to agree more than we do at the moment. That point may be a long way off, but it's worth thinking about. We want to make not just our current selves happy, but our future selves happy. And we want our future selves to be happy or say that was a good idea of their own free volition, right? If you take the example of an alcoholic and you give them a drink in the moment, they might thank you for it in the moment, but their future selves, regardless of whether or not they manage to control their addiction, are likely to thank you for not having given them a drink here in the present. Right? That's the same kind of idea here. We want an AI to be able to think about, would future humans retroactively say that was a good idea, even if they may not have thought, of, may not have thought so in the present, or vice versa. Right? An AI might implement a policy that most of us are happy with right now, but our children or grandchildren might curse us for saying that was not what we wanted, right? We might not be able to extrapolate that kind of complex dynamic into the future, but a super intelligent AI may, right? This is all in theory. Okay, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, there's a lot of problems or challenges with this uh, theory, as you can imagine. You need an AI that can come up with an accurate model of future human behavior. Tricky to do. You need to make sure that if you do have a, even if you have an accurate model of future humans, you can come up with a policy that will influence humans now, that in the future they will retroactively thank you for it, right? Again, very tricky. You want to come up with a policy that even if you hadn't implemented it, even if you hadn't implemented it, future humans would retroactively uh, regret that you did not implement it. Right? These are the kinds of things you're looking for. Very, very difficult to do. Who knows if we'll be able to do this. Just for fun, uh, we were thinking about our current work on grounding symbols. Maybe embodied agents can come to the rescue and rescue this idea of coherent extrapolated volition. Because the meaning of the word jump for our simple robots is not just grounded in the robot's own actions, its own physical experiences. The meaning of the word jump for these robots has a necessary social component, right? The meaning of the word jump is that if I do this, I think the crowd will respond in this way. Okay, so if you look at the red dotted line here for a moment, imagine uh, this simple robot here is, is thinking about a certain action that will result in it being on the ground 51% of the time. If you look carefully, that red line does not really intersect any of the red dots, which tells us that this particular action is not anything that the crowd has seen before. This is a simple example. It's pretty close to some of the things that the crowd has already seen before, but it is a novel action, right? Imagine an autonomous car or a super intelligent AI that's considering implementing a policy right now, but no human has seen that policy before, right? You have to be very careful in this situation. Well, what does the robot think is going to be the crowd's response to this novel action? So we're trying to think about what would be the vertical component 
uh, of this dot if the robot carried out this action. And you'll notice that this line is close to some red dots here, so it says maybe the crowd wouldn't like it if I performed that action. It's also close to some points here which says, well, some people in the crowd might be ambivalent, and at the top, some other people might think it's a good idea. So this is kind of a dangerous action to implement because there's going to be a large variation in the response from the crowd. It would be better to find another action somewhere on this plot where all of the, blue, all of the green dots are clustered and there aren't green dots at other points. So if you look all the way out here to the right, if we were to draw a line here, it intersects with these, line, with these points and not, is not very close to any of the other points. So that action seems a little safer. The robot is a little more confident that the crowd is going to dislike that action. Right? It's a little more confident in its prediction about how the crowd is going to respond. Again, a very simple example, but it's a road towards making machines that are not just blindly carrying out a utility function, but they are trying to maximize a utility function that has by necessity a social component. It can't do otherwise. So again, something to think about for uh, as we move forward. Um, just to come back to language for a moment, um, we had a discussion, an interesting discussion over lunch about embodied metaphors and, and George Lakoff. Um, as I just showed you, this robot has learned what JUMP means. The crowd also issued some of these other commands, go left, jump left, jump higher, don't jump as much, and so on. So could we present a website to the crowd that scaffolds the crowd so that they start with very concrete motoric language, like jump, and gradually, as the robots manage to ground those easily groundable symbols, like jump and go left, jump and jump left, because of the combinatorial nature of language, you can mix and match words, could you eventually get to the point where now you may not even have robots, but now you have chatbots that evolved from the robots that I just showed you, and because they're the descendants of robots that know what jump means, that a chatbot might understand what the the human idiom don't jump to conclusions means even if that robot or that chatbot has never heard that term before. It knows that it has something to do with discontinuity. Right? The robots know that if all the, all the touch sensors turn off, if there's a step event and then they turn back on again, that's, that's jump or that's, that has something to do with jump. In the same way, the flow of an argument or the chain of arguments I see that there's a jump or there's a discontinuity in the arguments you're giving me don't, don't jump to conclusions, right? So this is an idea that again has been around uh, in theory for a long time. Could we actually test these ideas of embodied metaphor um, uh, in a concrete manner? Okay, I got a few minutes left, so let me just conclude here. Um, just to summarize a little bit of what I've shown you, I've shown you a particular approach to robotics, which is a minority in robotics, um, where we try and evolve robots rather than build them. So we don't build our biases into our robots, right? We want evolution to figure out what is an appropriate brain and body combination for whatever it is we want our robots to do. I showed you a robot that's self-aware in the trivial sense, and it's able to use its self-awareness to uh, broaden the situations that it can deal with. It's still a very specialized machine, but it's now a little bit more general, a little bit more robust than robots that aren't self-aware in a trivial, trivial sense. I showed you language and meaning, so uh, we are defining what what meaning is for our robots. It's a combination of language, physical action, and social dynamics. You can't leave one, if you leave one of those three things out, the robot doesn't understand what jump means. There's also uh, an important aspect of mental simulation in here. What, I need to have a theory of mind, of, if I'm the robot, I need to have a theory of mind of the crowd to know what they may like or dislike if I'm going to try, if I'm going to try out a novel action to maximize the utility function that they gave me. Similarly, the crowd is also forming, to some degree, a mental model of the robots, right? The crowd started by issuing arbitrary commands and very quickly converged on simple motoric language. 
one aspect of which the robots actually were able to, to ground, right? So there, there's sort of this mutual scaffolding and theory of mind going both ways in this, this simple example. Okay, talked a little bit about why that may be important for in the long-term implications of AI of actually trying to make safe machines so they don't just maximize utility functions, they do it with humans in mind in a very concrete sense. Uh, I was mentioned to the grad students, I, I actually have two talks, and I was trying to decide which one to give. I gave the robots one today. Um, some of the things we work on in my lab is this idea of machine science, which is can you actually automate the scientific method as a whole? We have already automated hypothesis generation in science. Right? It's machine learning. Give a deep belief network a large data corpus or whatever observations you have, and it will give you back a parsimonious low error model. Right? So machines are now very good at formulating hypotheses, but that's only one part of the scientific method. Right? Could machines do well on other aspects of the scientific method? Would we want them to do that? Right? Uh, I'm happy to talk about this over some snacks or, or in the Q&A section. Okay, uh, the inevitable acknowledgments. Uh, Hod Lipson, Victor Zykoff, and Joey Annexberger contributed to the work that you saw today. Uh, the work that I showed you was sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Back to building robots in six seconds. Uh, if you go to Reddit, actually, and if you can code a little bit, you can actually try and evolve some robots uh, on your own. Thanks very much for your attention and, and your interest. <laughs>